All right, let us begin with Jarrett chapter 10, which is the Roaring Twenties, sometimes known as the Jazz Age. And as I've told you previously, uh, I believe the 1920s is probably, if not the most influential, most important decade in American history, it is uh, in the top two or three. I would put it up with the 1960s as being the most important decades in terms of change in American history. Let us begin. Uh, we are going to begin here with a little bit of an introductory paragraph. If you have your textbook or if you're looking at the PDF version, of the material, then you'll see this paragraph uh, in this chapter, as it states here. Again, we're looking at, once again, the Roaring Twenties, Chapter 10. Uh, in this chapter, you'll learn how Americans entered a new age of prosperity, prosperity being one of the key words, known as the Roaring Twenties. Automobiles, telephones, electricity, and then, of course, all the other subsequent jobs and uh, inventions that go along with those made life more comfortable than ever before. Americans generally focused on making money and enjoying themselves. Now keep in mind, this is after World War One. World War One had been a huge sacrifice for many Americans. And I mean, I'm not talking just about the families of the 300 plus thousand casualties of World War I, 116,000 dead and the 200 plus thousand who were wounded. I'm talking about the people who sacrificed pretty much every day in terms of rationing, in terms of changing the way they live, the suspension of freedom of speech to some extent with the uh, Espionage Act and on and on and on. So there's a lot of things happening in World War I some of which we discussed, not all, but some of which we discussed that made the, uh, the period of time from our involvement in 1917 up until 1920, 1921, that uh, really wasn't that great. So the 1920s came about, and people now were focusing in on, as opposed to saving uh, for war or to help the efforts overseas, they were now concentrating on making money, getting a new job buying new stuff, some of the new inventions that were coming out, whether it be the automobile or the vacuum cleaner or the radio, it doesn't really matter what it was. So making money and enjoying themselves. The real significance of the decade, and again, I think this is the real significance, was less in politics, less in politics than the birth of new values. These new values that are coming out, we're going to take a look at. We're going to discuss them. Beneath an appearance of calm, and again, it is a an appearance of calm and prosperity, America was experiencing fundamental, 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 very important, fundamental economic and social change. Those changes, both economically and socially, define the decade. All right, let us move on. Let's take a look at section one, and that is the section that we will cover in this particular video. Let's look at section one, adjusting to peace, and then you have 1919 to 1921, and this is the period of time we're going to be focusing in on in this section. The decade of, decade of the 20s opened with the difficult task, and it was pretty difficult, of adjusting to the peace. Now, again, we had not been at war for very long. The war started in 1914. We got into the war in 1917, and the war ended in 1919. Uh, so, again, it really wasn't a very long period of time for us. Uh, for the world, Europe, England, France, so forth and so on, and they were at war for about five years. We were around two years. But we had adjusted our economy, adjusted our society to a wartime mentality, and it was going to be difficult to adjust back to a peacetime mentality, a peacetime economy. Dissolution by the war. Okay, There was a great deal of disillusionment by the war because of the new weapons that had been invented, the easy and efficient ways that we created to kill, whether it be the airplane, whether it be the machine guns, whether it be chemical uh, weapons, whether it be anything. It dis disillusioned many Americans. America wanted to return to, because of that disillusionment, not so much by the numbers of people that we lost in combat, because again, our numbers were very low, relatively speaking, but it was that disillusionment of the war 
which wanted Americans to return to their traditional policies of isolationism in foreign affairs. Okay, we did not want to get back into foreign affairs. And of course, that refers to the isolation of foreign affairs, uh, refer, refusing to become involved in other nations' disputes or problems. Again, that's what isolation is. And this is a long-standing policy. We have talked about it numerous times, gone all the way, all the way back to George Washington, his, his farewell address. We were literally forced, dragging, kicking, and screaming into World War I because of the Germans' Their efforts with the Zimmerman note to get the Mexicans to attack us, the sinking of the Lusitania, for example, that's just one. But there are a number of ships that were sunk that cost American lives, the unrestricted submarine uh, warfare. All these things contribute to our, be our getting involved. And again, that is not what we wanted. We would uh, prefer to have remained isolated from the rest of the world, but we could not because, again, of a number of factors. The broaching of the freedom of the seas, our long-standing relationship with the allied nations, England and France in particular. The fact that we loan them a lot of money, and if they lose the war, we probably do not get paid back. And there are a couple of others, which we've discussed previously. Anyway, let us move back to our paragraph here. The government stopped its wartime spending, and soldiers returned home. And again, yay, soldiers coming home for the war, and they were looking for jobs. Again, they had joined either voluntarily or had been drafted and they came home looking for a job many of the jobs or many of the soldiers had left good jobs and those jobs are now filled by others whether it be women african americans as part of the great migration or others it doesn't really matter they came home looking for jobs factories that had been closed to convert from military to civilian production uh, were now going to start to reopen so during the war, we converted our factories. Again, we, we were not nearly as industrialized as we would be in the late 1920s or even today. But the factories of the day were converted from civilian to military. And now we had to convert them back from military to civilian. From military to civilian. And that would take a lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of money. And it did create a lot of jobs, though. Farmers lost many of their markets in Europe. Why? Well, Europeans, for example, didn't have a lot of money. They needed to eat, but they didn't have the money to buy our food. And so we had some problems early on. That, that interim period of time from the end of the war to the 1920s really got started. And when the prosperity really started to flow, and because of the need to convert from material, uh, military to civilian, and because many farmers, again, lost those markets because of a lack of money in Europe, we had some problems. These factors, and others, led to a temporary economic recession. Recession is an economic slow, an economic slowing, a downturn, which in the United States lasted from 1919 to 1921. All right. Our first subtopic, the Red Scare. And of course, the color red is associated with communism in our history. Uh, toward the end of the war, the Russian government was overthrown, which we're going to be discussing in this paragraph. And when the war is over, we start to see an influx of immigrants from those nations, like Russia, where communism had become a way of life, and we were concerned about what would happen. So let's get to this. The end of World War I brought many new fears to Americans. And these fears were of communists and communism, anarchists, people who do not favor any form of government, really don't want any kind of government, and a fear of immigrants. Again, these immigrants would be from countries that had become communistic or had communist influences on the government. Russia had been ill-prepared for the war. I mean, come on, Russia had been ill-prepared for the war. It was a large, is a large country with a good-sized population, but it is a scattered population. It was not overly industrialized and had yet to learn to properly make use of its resources. In 1917, because, again, of a lack of preparedness, because of a huge number of casualties during the war, and the Russians suffered millions of casualties, dead and wounded in the war, strikes in cities, 
and soldiers mutinies. Soldiers were mutinying, uh, going against the orders of their commanding officers, led to an overthrow, a removal of the Tsar, Tsar Nicholas. Uh, the Tsar essentially is, uh, for our purposes, the king. And so the leader of Russia, Tsar Nicholas, and his family were captured by communist revolutionaries. Clean that up a little bit. By communist revolutionaries led by Vladimir Lenin. So the communists seized power. And one of the first things they did was take the Tsar, his family out, put him against the wall, and executed him. Let's move on to our next slide. So, the Tsar is dead, and communists control Russia. The communists threaten to spread a revolution to other countries in Europe, like Germany and Hungary. Now, again, you got to keep in mind, here in America, we are a republic, a representative democracy, if you will. We often miss use the word democracy, but okay. And so communism was the exact opposite of what we believe in. Their economic views, socialism, are again the exact opposite of what we believe in. So the communists now control Russia, and one of the main goals of Russian communism is was world domination. So when they threatened to spread the revolution, countries took notice. When a wave of strikes hit the United States in 1919, many Americans feared this was the start of the communist revolution here in America. The resulting fear, which we refer to as a Red Scare, created this atmosphere of panic. Anything bad happened, it was attributed to the communists. The communists sort of became our boogeyman. Okay, the Palmer Rays, and this Palmer Rays should have been in darker, bolder print, sorry about that. In 1919, uh, Italian anarchists, and we'll talk more about them later, we've already talked about Sacco and Vanzetti, we'll probably come up with, uh, refer to them again, set off a bomb outside the home of Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer, or Mitchell Palmer. So he is the Attorney General of the United States of America, and a bomb was set off in front of his house by these anarchists from the country of Italy. The bombing was only one in a series. There was a series of attacks on that day on judges, politicians, and law enforcement officials in eight American cities, including Cleveland, Cleveland, and New York. As you can well imagine... We had, not too long ago, uh, the terrorist attack, the Islamic terrorist attack in California. Imagine that there were seven other attacks just like that. Maybe not as bloody, maybe not as with as many casualties, but there were eight attacks on one day, coordinated attacks. And you can well imagine the panic that resulted from such actions. The nation demanded that action be taken, that something be done. Palmer then, I'm sorry, Palmer was convinced that a radical plot existed to overthrow the United States government, and so he took steps. In January of 20, keep in mind, this is about a year after the first attack. The first attack was in January of 1919. In January of 1920, Palmer ordered the roundup of about 4,000 suspects in several cities without warrants. This is the key part, without warrants. His assistant, a man by the name of J. Edgar Hoover, directed the raids. Palmer arrested men he accused he accused of plotting to overthrow the government. Most were later released. Most were later released after spending a short amount of time in jail and being interrogated by the people working for Palmer, okay, Attorney General Palmer. Uh, again, he was the Attorney General of the United States, the Department of Justice. However, 600 were eventually deported because of what Palmer believed were communist ties or that they presented a threat to the United States. Now, we've already talked about Sacco and Vanzetti, but we're going to hit it again because it is extremely important. Sacco and Vanzetti. Let me redo that. There we go. 
So Akko and Vizzetti, they were Italians, okay, two Italian immigrants, who, again, there is their full names, I think we already walked through this in the last chapter, were convicted of committing murder during a robbery. The robbery was allegedly committed, allegedly committed to obtain funds for the anarchist revolution. So they robbed uh, a business, a bank, in order to gather money to fund a revolution against the United States government. Pressure from many sources around the world came to the United States to release them. But because of the anti-communist hysteria that was attached to immigrants, that didn't happen. Many Americans fearing looking weak to the rest of the world, they feared, many Americans, including our government officials, feared that we would look weak to the rest of the world if we let them go. Although the evidence was insufficient to convict them, again, now we're starting to look at a little bit of a personal view of this. Uh, the judge was extremely partial in his conduct of the trial. Uh, what that's saying is basically he was biased against Sacco and Vanzetti. They were found guilty and executed in 1927. Now again, this is, according to the Jared book, there was really insignificant uh, evidence to support them, but because the judge was biased, as it states here, as it states here that the judge was extremely partial, biased in his conduct of the trial towards Sacco they were found guilty and executed in 1927. Supporters, and there were a lot of them, of Sacco Mazzetti believed their uh, innocence and that their conviction, believed that their conviction was due to their anarchist views. Okay, again, supporters of Sacco Mazzetti believed that their conviction was due to their views, not their actual guilt. Despite jurors who insisted that the anarchist views of Sacco Mazzetti had played no part in their conviction. So jurors insisted that their views played no part in the decision to find them guilty, and then execute them. Let's move on to the next slide. The rise of nativism and racism. Nativism, of course, is a term that we have discussed numerous times. It is sort of a, uh, a perverted view of your own country, the perverted belief that your country is far superior to every other country. We talked about this leading up to the beginning of World War I. The Red Scare, the anarchist bombings, and the Sacco and Vanzetti trial contributed to the rise of nativism. Okay, uh, Nativism is an offshoot of nationalism, which I kind of mentioned a moment ago without mentioning nationalism, but okay. Nationalism is a belief that your country is better than everybody else, everyone else, and that Nationalism leads to nativism, uh, dislike of foreigners. Because again, my country is so much better than your country. If you're from that inferior country, then you have to be inferior. So, natives believe that white Protestant Americans were superior to all other people. Now, this kind of goes back to the white man's burden, social Darwinism, and concepts we have discussed previously. This is sort of a rebirth of that. As you'll learn later in this chapter, these attitudes led to new restrictions on immigration. We'll take a look at several of the bills that were passed into law that would reduce immigration. And this is all due, again, to nativism, that fear, that dislike of foreigners. Why? Well, because of the Red Scare. In the fear of anarchists, of communists coming to America and attempting to overthrow our government, which was aided by the anarchist bombings in January of 1919, including the home of the Attorney General, which is kind of bold. 
And then, of course, the Sokol Vanzetti trial. You add all those up, the Red Scare, anarchist bombings, and Sokol and Vanzetti, and you have a recipe for nativism. The migration of African Americans from the South to the North, the Great Migration, which we discussed in the last chapter, also led to increased racial tensions, racial tensions after the war. Many blacks had joined the military, had gone to war, had been to Europe, had been to uh, France, and they had been treated better there than they were treated here. And they came back home after helping fight and win the war, thinking, hey, we should be treated better. We are soldiers. We are heroes. And they were. And they were treated not better. In fact, in many ways, they were treated even worse. The KKK, and we've discussed these suckers numerous times, dead for decades, well, dead is not the right word, dormant uh, for decades, found new life beginning in 1915 and moving forward in the 1920s. Clan members, the Klan was hostile to a lot of people, a lot of different groups. They didn't like immigrants, they didn't like Catholics, they didn't like Jews, they didn't like African Americans, and you can bet they didn't really care for Hispanics as, as well. So you're looking at all these groups that the Klan was hostile to, immigrants, Catholics, Jews, African Americans, and again we could throw in gays and Hispanics and pretty much every other minority out there. There were several major rice, rice, uh, race riots that broke out just after the war uh, in many American cities. Part of this was due, again, to the fact that these racial tensions were brought about due to the blacks coming back and believing that they deserved, which they did, no doubt about it, they believed that they deserved better treatment, and they did. But with the growth of the Klan... the blacks were treated as bad, if not worse. The worst of the rioting occurred in Chicago, where 38 people were killed. The lynching of African Americans, again, lynching is the hanging of African Americans. It is really aimed at them. Also continued, as well as segregation in the South. Okay, The South is still a huge Democrat stronghold. The Klan got most of its members from Democrats in the South. Now, again, could you find the Klan in the North and other areas? Yeah, but predominantly it was found in the South, which was a stronghold of, still, of the Democrat Party still. So, we have all these problems happening. Let's move on to our next slide. The three Republican presidents. Oh, that is horrible typing. I need to fix that, okay? Harding, Coolidge, which is misspelled, sorry about that, and Hoover, okay? In 1920s, Republicans returned to the White House. Keep in mind, in 1912 and 1916, the Democrat, Woodrow Wilson, won those two elections. Now, of course, prior to Woodrow Wilson, the presidents of the 1900s had been Teddy Roosevelt and Howard William Howard Taft, and so... Wilson is the only Democrat in that mix. In the 1920s, the Republicans dominated the White House. Okay, from 1920 through 1933. So the 1920, the 1924, the 1928 elections were won by Republicans. And it wasn't until the Democrat Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, won in 32, was that broken up, that cycle broken up. So Republicans controlled the presidency for about 12 years, overseeing the prosperity of the, of the 20s, as well as the arrival of the Great Depression that ended that prosperity. Now again, you, you can't come out and say that it's the Republicans' fault that the Great Depression occurred. Now, do they have a lot to do with it? Yeah, in many ways. Their policies favoring business, which we'll take up in just a moment, uh, created an atmosphere in which abuse could be found, and it was that abuse that led to the stock market collapsing, which led to the Great Depression. Could that abuse been found under a Democrat president? Yes, it could have been. In fact, some of it uh, took place during the Wilson administration. However, it was Republicans who favored laissez-faire. It was Republicans who favored laissez-faire, hands-off policies, which, of course, had a great deal of influence in the 1920s. So we're looking at 
economic policy is favoring business. Government policy is favoring big business. Presidents Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover followed uh, policies favorable to American business. Again, uh, the Republicans were really the uh, party of business at that time. And their policies, also known primarily as laissez-faire, will have a great deal to do with this. Let's take a quick look at the Harding administration. Uh, you know what? In fact, we're going to go ahead and end it at this time, I do believe. Uh, time has kind of gotten away from me. And we are, oh my gosh, we are far from being finished with Section 1. And I, I don't really want to drag this on. It's already gone a little bit further, a little bit longer than I, I really wanted to. So we're going to end uh, Section 1 of uh, Chapter 10 right now. Uh, we'll finish it now, and we'll come back and have uh, Section 1, Part B, uh, in the next video. So we're going to go ahead and end it at this time.